What's going on everybody? Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and whatever time it is. I welcome back to yet another video with you, man. Immersionholic, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my first ever beginner's guide to Divide Tempera on the channel. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Today, this video is entirely tailored towards you Divide Tempera beginners. Despite us being in 10 years now, or at least approaching 10 years since Total War Rome 2 was released, Divided to Para is still one of the most popular mods for Room 2 uh, and it's still getting brand new players coming in every single day and the year 2023 is your year. If you still have not tried out Divided to Para, now is the time to do it and your boy Immersionholic is here to help you out get started. So this is going to be a bit of a longer video but I'm going to get everything that you need to get started in DEI. Uh, all into one video. So first off, we're going to go ahead with the installation. I'm going to show you the quickest and easiest way to do it so you do not have any problems whatsoever. After that, we're going to actually look at the campaigns that you can choose from. Uh, there's actually a few custom ones from the DEI team, so I highly recommend you stick around to make sure that you choose a campaign and a faction, by the way, that is going to be best suitable to your beginner sort of standing in DEI. And then the third section of this video is where I'm going to take a little bit of extra time and we're going to go over all of the major features that you need to know about Divided to Para before you get in game. Uh, knowing, just knowing about these features will help you understand everything that's going on and make sure that you don't get frustrated when you can't do things, for example, recruit certain legions when you run out of population and you have no idea there was a population mechanic. Uh, but anyway, if you're brand new to DEI, or maybe if you've watched a little bit of content on it, but now you finally want to jump in yourself, this video is for you. If you uh, yourself are a veteran of DEI and you're watching, please feel free to comment any other suggestions you have down below and help out the new players and newcomers coming into DEI. As there are new people coming in every single day, and I'm always getting new comments on my videos asking for guides for beginners or for newer players. So hopefully, this will help you all get started in Divided to Para in 2023, ladies and gentlemen. Can you believe it? 10 years for Rome 2. But anyway, without any further ado, let's jump into it. Timestamps down below, by the way. So before we even jump in game, let's go to your Steam library. You must absolutely have a legal copy of Divided to Para. If you do not, I cannot help you. Neither can the DEI team. Just get Total War Rome 2 on Steam guys, it's very easy, uh, very cheap, especially if you wait for a uh, Steam sale that comes along. Uh, Creative Assembly is very kind in that it actually offers a lot of sales on all of the Total War games throughout the uh, year, uh, basically every single year. So if you can't, if you're a little tight on cash and you can't afford spending that extra money, just wait a few months, keep an eye on your wish list, and uh, you'll see. Uh, Total War Rome 2 getting a pretty hefty discount alongside its DLCs. Although, in my opinion, it's well worth the full uh, payment if you can do so, at least with mods. Anyway, so we start off on Steam, we have Total War Rome 2 installed. Now, if for whatever reason you have used mods in the past for Total War Rome 2 that are not divided to Imperial related, I highly recommend you go to the workshop and you unsubscribe from them get rid of them you want a completely clean slate so if you have used any mods at all I highly recommend you go and uninstall them and then probably even then reinstall your Total War Rome 2 delete your data folder entirely for Rome 2 just to make sure that you do not have any mod conflicts remember this is just to get you into Divided Tempera uh, we're not even bothering with sub mods for the mod or anything like that so right now get yourself a clean installation of Total War Rome 2 that is the best and safest way to get started. And so, once you have a clean installation of Total War Room 2, we're gonna go ahead and go to the workshop. And then, right here, we're just gonna type in Divide at Impera. I don't need to, but I'm just gonna show you guys exactly how you can do this. Up here in the search bar, Divide at Impera. You're gonna see a bunch of mods come up because there's a lot of different sub mods and a lot of different ways in which DEI has been released, so it can be a little bit overwhelming, which is why I wanted to show you guys this part. So what we are looking for here is Divided to Para Part 1. You'll see this very iconic logo for the DEI team right here. 
So we're going to go ahead and click on it. Make sure it says D uh, divided to pair part one by Dresden. Dresden being the head of the DEI team. Go ahead and click on that. You're going to see a whole list of swaps, um, support features, everything that you need to know about DEI is either here or linked here as well. So I highly recommend you check out the description. But anyway, for the purpose of this video, let's continue by just subscribing. You can see that I am already subscribed to this mod. But you're going to go ahead and you're going to subscribe to Divide It in Para Part 1. You just click on this green button for you. It should say um, subscribe without the D at the end. Um, go ahead and press it. You'll see at the bottom of your screen you'll have downloads where it will uh, go for perhaps a few minutes. Depends on your internet connection. But after it stops, you have now downloaded Divide It in Para Part 1. However, you can see on the right hand side over here it says required items this item requires all of the following other items so now we need to go to divide it in para part two and divide it in para part three you can also go down here to this collection uh, that was created by dresden very very helpful still lists all of the divide it in para uh, features or whatnot but you can just scroll down all the way down to here and you can just click on each of these check marks doesn't really matter what order you do it in um, we'll fix the load order shortly, but you absolutely, if you're if you're downloading Divided to Para from the Steam Workshop, you have to have Divided to Para Part One, Part Two, and Part Three. I got a little confused there because they're in the middle, but anyway, you must have all three parts at least at the time of this video, which is recorded in January of 2023. Might change in the future, but as far as I'm aware, it won't. Um, the only exception to this is if you're like me and you manually download Divide It to Pair from the website. But this video is not going to cover that because I do not recommend you do that if you're a beginner to Divide It to Pair. So anyway, you follow my instructions, you div you've downloaded uh, Divide It to Pair Part 1, Part 2, Part 3. So you wait for the download to go ahead and now the download is complete. So we go back to our games library. Let's go ahead and check out Rome 2. Um, you want to make sure that this just says the green play button. It's not saying uh, syncing or anything like that. It should be fine. We're going to go ahead and we're just going to press play. You're going to see a little window pop up and then we get a bigger window popping up. This lists all of the Creative Assembly games right here from the Total War series. Uh, that's because this is basically uh, the game launcher. And in the game launcher for all of these different games, it has, you'll see right here, it says Mod Manager. Mod Manager is exactly how you want to manage your mods, at least for Rome 2. Other games might have different third-party uh, mod managers that you might want to try and use. But for Rome 2, we just want to go ahead and click on Mod Manager. It might take a minute, and then you're going to see this window pop up. Now, I have a lot of sub-mods here, so please ignore all of these. Although eventually, as you play Divided to Para more and more, you'll see uh, that you yourself will want to get your own mods and have fun with them. Um, you will even see down here, I have two Divided to Para mods, part one and part two, but that's not what we're looking for for you. What we're looking for for you is Divided to Para part one, part two, and part three. And you'll see here, I check them off. Let me just take, turn these off really quickly. Um, and this is how we want your divided to pair to look. So if you're if you're following my advice, you should only have three mods here, and it should only say divided to pair part one, part two, and part three, and that's it. That should be the only mods that you have if you're brand new to DEI and you're following this guide. Make sure that divided to pair part one is at the bottom, part two in the middle, and part three on top. Um, it should still work if you mix them up, but I still highly recommend put part one at the bottom just to make sure it absolutely works. And then that's it. Divided to Para is installed. You've clicked these boxes on the left to get the uh, green to appear. Once the green appears, it means that the mod is turned on. Another thing you can do is over here on the right hand side under where it says status, you can look for the check mark. As long as you have a check mark, it means that your game is, I mean that your mods are installed. That means that they're active on your game. Now you do not exit out of this, do not exit. What you want to do is go ahead and press play when you're ready. You're going to see this window pop up. It's going to tell you a bunch of warnings about mods, but like, hey, they might break the game, yada, yada, yada. We know this, we know what we're prepared for. Um, but you follow this guy, you're doing very well. Again, please ignore all of these other mods. These are just uh, for my own use. 
Uh, you're only going to see three mods listed in this, but it does list all of the mods that you have active in the mod manager. And then you have the option to disable mods or play, and you are obviously going to press play. Sometimes you might get a warning from the mod manager saying some of these mods are out of date. Uh, out of date. Um, ignore warning or disable out of date mods. Just ignore the warning. It's no big deal. It's just basically a safeguard from Creative Assembly to let you know, hey, some of these mods might not be up to date because they aren't official things from Creative Assembly. It's from players just like me and you who put in a lot of time, energy, and passion into making mods. So sometimes mods do go out of date and then they can't work anymore. Divided to Para, despite still going 10 years after Rome 2's release, almost 10 years, uh, it's still being very much updated with some big updates still in the way. So don't worry about that. Feel free to, pre to press ignore this warning and then your game will start up. Um, so anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the installation. I'm going to go ahead and close out of this now. But that's it for the installation. You should now get into the main, uh, menu and you will see the image that I'll show you here in the part two section of this video. Again, please, if you have any questions about the installation or any issues, comment down below and I will do my utmost to help you out the best I can. Alrighty, everybody, it's time for you to get involved in Divided Tempera. Finally, you've completed your very easy installation, you've started up your game, and you are confronted with this beautiful background. At least it's probably still going to be this one. Now, let's go ahead and go through each of the campaigns very quickly, and I'll let you know what the campaign is, and I'll let you know what campaigns I recommend you, who I'm assuming is a newcomer to Divided Tempera, who you should play as and what campaigns you should focus on as you tip your tippy toes into the water that is divided to para. Um, so first off, let's begin with the classic Grand Campaign. The Grand Campaign starts in 278 BC, so I really strongly recommend you focus on playing the Grand Campaign, so that way you get the full DI experience. And while it can be a bit intimidating because it is a big campaign map, Regardless, you're still going to start off fairly slow as a DNA mod itself plays a lot slower than vanilla. So, anyway, what factions do I recommend for the Grand Campaign? Well, first off, I recommend Rome. Instant classic. Relatively easy. Um, there are some difficulties that come with it, but overall, even if you're brand new to Divide Act Empire, you should have a campaign as Rome and do relatively well. Um, although, don't just stop the video here and go ahead and play as Rome. I do have some caveats that I need to add for all of these factions at the end of the video, where we'll talk about some major changes that DEI implements. So even if you play as Rome, which is an easy faction, you still need to know these massive key things, which we'll talk about very soon. Um, so anyway, Rome, it's up to you what faction of Rome you want to play as. They all control the same amount of territory as Rome. You're not going to be divided. Like, for example, the Julia don't just own northern Italy or anything, they own all of the Roman territory. Same thing if you play as the Junior clan or the Cornelia clan, up to you entirely. Anyway, after that, what do I recommend? I recommend we go over here, we'll click on the Diadochoi, and I recommend you play as Egypt. Egypt is a large kingdom, but it is very contained. Uh, there's only a couple cities which are off on their own, one being Cyprus and one being in southern Anatolia which while it is a little bit stressful having your empire slightly stretched out in Egypt you are still clumped together for the most part uh, and overall it's a fantastic faction to play as you're one of the best factions in the game in regards to your economy you have excellent uh, units uh, for your military roster you have a lot of Greek units you have Egyptian you have African you have a lot of variety as well despite you just being locked into Egypt uh, and just overall, it's a relatively easy campaign. You do have a minor little cultural issue that you need to deal with, but that's just going to require just a little bit of extra care to your public order. Overall, Egypt is quite easy, and I recommend it highly if you're new to DEI. Next off, we go to the Cretani culture right here. This is your Britannic factions, uh, at least your British Isle factions. So we have the Iceni the Caledonians in, up in uh, Scotland, and then we have the, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it, I dead, I'll never get it right, but the Irish right here. I highly recommend you check out the Iceni. 
Um, they have a very easy starting position, one of the safest areas in the game, because not only do you have a good city, which is a walled city that you can defend from other barbarians, but you are on Britain. So once you take over Britain, it's going to be very hard for any faction in Gaul or in uh, the continent of Europe to come and invade you. It's quite easy to beat them back, and so that way you can pick and choose when you want to get involved on the mainland. Um, it is a barbarian faction, so barbarian factions overall in DEI do struggle, but it is a very good tutorial barbarian faction, so that way you can get used to the different mechanics, different economies, and different units that barbarians are subject to in DEI. The Iceni, I highly recommend you check them out if you want to dip your toes into the barbarian factions. However, if you want to continue your barbarian interests, I highly recommend you go to the Germans. All the way here on the far right hand side we have the Germani culture. Here we have the Lugos, the Suevos, and the Kimbros. The Kimbri, uh, aka the Kimbros, are a faction that's completely unique to DEI. They have an awesome roster, uh, interesting starting position. It's a little bit tumultuous, so it's not necessarily easy, but they are a really fun faction to play. So my recommendation is you either play as a Kimbri or as Swaby. The Swaby are very well known in Vanilla Rome too. Um, some of you guys who are watching this might remember the terror days of the Swaby where they could make an entire fully fledged army route before even getting into contact with them. It was crazy back in those days. Here you will not have that same OP scare tactics but the Swaby do play similar. Um, and they're just a classic barbarian faction. If you've played Rome 2 at all, you will know the Swaby, and they are fun. They're fun in DEI, and they have a pretty good starting position in that they're surrounded by um, potential enemies, but all of them are very small. They only have one city each, and you have a large walled city in the middle of Germania. So um, it's actually a very good starting faction, and in fact, I would recommend the Swaby over the Kimbri. I just mentioned the Kimbri because they're unique to DEI, and I think you guys should definitely play as them, but at least play as a Swaby first just to get an eye of how the Germanic Barbarians are played, which is still different to the ICD and other Barbarians. So that's my other Barbarian faction that I recommend for the Grand Campaign. Let's move on to my last recommendation, which if we come up here to the Barata Cultural Group, this is Moria. Uh, you can see it says Moria Sem Raja. This is the Mauryan Empire, also known as the Indian Empire at this time, or an empire in India, as it consisted of a lot of different cultures and groups. But anyway, at the time of this campaign, Moria is a massive empire. However, this particular faction of Moria can be kind of considered like a vanguard kingdom of Moria that's been sent west to invade into Persia. You're on the very edges of the map here, um, so you're just going to be invading west and northwest and southwest, west all the way, and you are basically representing the Mauryan Empire. It's a little bit tricky in that you have no other Mauryan or Indian factions on the map, so you're going to have very few friends in that regard. However, um, it's really another awesome way that DEI has demonstrated the skill uh, that they have as modders and developers, and it just is... A really unique faction that everyone has to play at least once. They have amazing units, big towering monstrous elephants, uh, incredibly skilled gilded warriors, some of the best shock infantry in the game, some of the best archers in the game with their half-naked longbowmen that can shoot ridiculous lengths and whatnot. It's just an incredible faction. A little bit of a tricky start but overall you're in a relatively safe position so I would highly recommend you play as the Maureens. Now these are all of the factions I recommend you try. There is a couple other campaigns that you could do as a newbie to DEI. Um, out of all of these other campaigns, my next one that I would recommend to you would be Hannibal at the Gates. Hannibal at the Gates is very contained as you can see. It's still very similar to vanilla Hannibal at the Gates. Uh, this is obviously going to require you have the Hannibal at the Gates DLC, um, but I would highly recommend you play as either Carthage or as Rome. Rome would be better here as it's a little bit more contained, but both factions are somewhat spread out. Uh, you can also try and check out the Lusitani, the Aravaki, um, all of these other smaller factions as it is a smaller campaign map, so you should have an easier time with it. Um, but Rome and Carthage would be the quintessential factions I would try here. 
Um, it's also very good for multiplayer campaigns, whether you want to do co-op or head-to-head, -head, up to you. Um, but it's a very fun map for that. Now, this is going to be a little bit of an interesting take, but another campaign I recommend you try is Caesar and Gaul. Everyone who's played Run 2 and has the Caesar and Gaul DLC knows that Caesar and Gaul is still very hard. It's probably the hardest DLC there is for Run 2. So that's why you might think it's kind of weird that I'm recommending you play it. However, because you're going into this knowing that it is a very hard DLC, you should be at least somewhat mentally prepared for that. However, the reason that I suggest you play this DLC is that it starts off with Rome being in the late Republican era where it's hit the Marian reforms. So this is where you not only get to play as Caesar, which is pretty badass, but you get proper legionnaires. Turn one at the beginning of the game. Um, so with that, you can basically create legions relatively quite quickly, get invading into Gaul and just basically go on attacking Gallic tribe after Gallic tribe. Um, it, like I said, it is still very difficult and especially with the DEI mechanics, I'll talk about shortly, but it's very straightforward in that you're playing as Rome, nobody likes you, at least almost, almost everybody hates you. Go ahead and conquer as much as you can, have fun with that. It's going to be a lot of interesting battles, it's going to be tough, but overall it's not really an overwhelming campaign because you don't have a massive empire to manage. And even when you do start taking over new territory, it's going to pre be pretty standard in how you handle it. You need to control public order and try and convert the culture, and that's kind of it. Um, but anyway, I would really recommend you play this as Rome. Playing as a Swaby can be fun, but that's going to be a lot trickier because you're surrounded by uh, Celts who also don't like you and you have the Romans coming up to mess with you but it could be a fun campaign if you're a little bit more of a skilled vanilla Rome 2 player um, and then that after that I would recommend either the Averni play as the Celts or as the Nervii and the Nervii have a really fun roster relatively safe position up here in the north on the map um, and just overall a good fun camp, uh, good fun faction to play especially in this campaign where there's going to be a lot of battles and be that's one of the reasons I recommend this campaign is because you could get used to how battles flow in Divine Tempera relatively quickly because it will be a lot of battles. Um, we have a lot of other campaigns here. Um, I'm not going to overview all of them, but none of the rest of them I would recommend to you. Um, two things to note that Empire Divided and Rise of the Republic have not really been completely tailored to fit DEI. Rise of the Republic is in a better state, um, so it's playable and overall somewhat balanced. There is modders who are working on this though for DEI, um, so keep an eye out on that for the more information. Um, I'll be covering it once it's released. Empire Divided is playable for Divine Tempera, but it's only recently been made playable, and even then, it's not entirely balanced. You can still have a campaign and still have fun, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, at least. It's not going to be as fun or balanced as, say, the Grand Campaign. We then have two unique uh, campaigns for Divine Tempera. We have the Alexander Campaign, where you get to play as the Alexander the Great. However, this is a pretty hard campaign, and it's a very big slugfest where you're playing as Alexander, and you're taking on Persia and its hundreds of allies. <laughs> very tough, um, but, I mean, if you want to use Greek armies with the typical Sarissa and whatnot, that's where you could go if you want to play as him. But I wouldn't recommend it as a new person to DEI. And the Macedonian War is a similar sort of deal, uh, especially if you're saying is playing as a faction like the Romans. Uh, it's not going to be a fun campaign, it's going to be very tough for you. Um, you could try and play as Macedon I guess, but then it's going to be just a complete walkover and it's a very limited map and it doesn't really demonstrate a lot about DEI in my opinion. This is just a campaign you play if you love Greek military history for antiquity. Um, which I mean I'm sure plenty of you guys do, I do myself, but it's quite limited. Uh, you're not going to really have any of the Diadochi getting involved except Macedon and the Seleucids and even then it's only a little small part of the Seleucid Empire. So. Just something to keep in mind. Oh, you do have the Ptolemies as well, but again, very small part of it. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go through all of the other campaigns, but just remember, I recommend the Grand Campaign, I recommend Hannibal at the Gates, and I recommend Caesar in 
goal. Don't forget those factions I listed to you as well for their grand campaign. I'll list them again one more time very quickly. First off, Rome. Second off, uh, Moria. Then the Swaby. Then the Iceni. And then Egypt. In any particular order you like, those are the starter factions I would recommend. Alrighty everybody, now we are going to talk about some of the major features in Divide It Impera. I'm not going to cover them in a massive amount of detail, I'm just going to let you know that they are there and that you need to be aware of them in order to have a relatively successful campaign. If you completely ignore all of these systems, then you're going to have problems, you're going to get frustrated and not understand what's happening and why, at least in some aspects. So I would highly recommend you pay some serious attention to at least this part of the video. Don't exit out of the video just yet because this is crucial information for you to have a good campaign. So, let's jump into it. First off, my major point for you to understand is that there are a lot of military units in Divided Tempera. In fact, there are over 2,000 units, reportedly almost around 2,500 units. Now that sounds overwhelming at first, however, you need to understand these are spread all around the map. This isn't just dedicated to just a few factions. Every faction in DEI has been completely overhauled, built up from the ground up, and its military rosters have been adjusted. Now, saying that, that's something that we need to consider as well, is that there is a few different ways in which you can recruit troops. For example, if we go to the custom battle screen, you're going to see I have selected Rome, and these are all of my units as Rome. Now, the majority of these units come from a single category of units which is what we call a faction roster. A faction roster is a roster of units uh, for example let me go unit info such as these Hastati, Semnite Hastati and regular Hastati here. These are units, these are cool units assigned to the Roman roster. If you're playing in the grand campaign which I have selected right here as Rome you will use or be able to use any of these units at some point in your campaign something to consider okay so every faction in the game has a core roster if i select any faction right here because we're in the custom battle screen let's go to egypt the faction i recommended you play we click on it all of these units are core to the egyptian roster there's a couple of units that are not necessarily core to it such as these galatians but we'll talk about that in a second um but majority of the rosters of the units you're going to see on these rosters are core roster faction units then we come to the area of recruitment units. Now the area of recruitment or what is commonly referred to as a AOR unit is a unit that is local to a specific city and region. Um, for example, if you go to Syria, you're going to be able to recruit Syrian heavy archers. Um, another example is the Balearic Slingers. If you take over the Balearic Islands, you're going to be able to recruit Balearic Island Slingers. These guys are fantastic, as are the Syrian Heavy Archers, by the way. Um, we can see them here just as Rome, but I don't believe Rome has any other AOR units I can show you. Uh, we have Companion Cavalry here. This is also an AOR unit. Now, something to understand about AOR units or Area of Recruitment units is that there is a limited amount of them, and only factions that control the region that a unit is from can recruit them and you can only recruit it while your army is in that region so if you want to recruit your Balearic Slingers you need to actually have your general stations in the Balearic Islands to be able to get them uh, and that's applied to a whole host of different AOR units AOR units are available in every single city on the map every single region um, there's a massive variety and they are all historically authentic as are all of the units in DEI but the AOR units are also special in that they are limited. Um, there is only a certain number of them that you can recruit into all of your armies. It's not just into, like, say, two units per army. It's going to be around six or so units for your entire faction. So if you want to recruit a lot of, like, Balearic Slingers, you get 20 of them. It's not going to happen. You can't do it. You're limited. Uh, it's just for balancing reasons and whatever reasons the DEI team has come up with. Um, that's the caveat for AOR units. Second off we then have auxiliary units and these auxiliary units are basically units that have been trained in the Roman fashion. They are 
far into Rome. For example, when I click on this unit right here and I go over to the right hand side, it will say Aquitanian Heavy Auxiliaries. And the description reads, the swordsmen of Aquitania are as brave as any Roman in battle and use the gladius with similar skill. Thus you can tell that these men are from Aquitania and they've been treated, I mean trained with the Roman gladius in the Roman style. They're not going to be necessarily as effective as a typical Roman legionary, but they're going to be pretty bloody close. Um, so that's worth noting that is a possibility when you play as Rome. Very, very cool. Adds in a whole new dynamic to recruiting your rosters and making them immersive because you can recruit from a local population that has been trained in your unit's uh, manner and whatnot. And then the last category of units you can get is mercenaries. Mercenaries are home to provinces, not just a single city region, but they are available in an entire province. As long as you have your general in that province, you can recruit from its mercenary pool, so you don't even need to actually own territory in there in order to be able to recruit them. Mercenary units are limited in that they are only going to be spawning one to two units at a time, they take quite a while to replenish depending on the rarity and the level of the unit um, and the AI can recruit mercenary units if they have a general in the area as well. So do be wary of that. If you are defending a region and you have say elephants, you might want to recruit them as mercenaries so that the AI doesn't do it when they come in and invade. Um, but they still might be able to so it's just something to keep in mind mercenary units are also typically more professional than AOR units but they're also going to be a lot more expensive to recruit and to maintain. So that's a little overview of the different categories of units. Let's just review the names again. You have faction rosters, AOR units, or area of recruitment units, mercenary units, and then you also have auxiliary units as well. Now I have two more points to note before we jump into a campaign to show off some other things. First off, there is a reform progression system in DEI. And there is no better faction to showcase that to you as other than Rome. Now playing as Rome, you can see that we have a massive roster here with a lot of different units available. However, they are not all available at the same time. For example, we go to our melee infantry, which is either your swords and axemen or whatever. Um, you can see that if I hover over this unit, we have Hastati. It says Hastati Sem, uh, Sem Knight Hastati basically. And then we have regular Roman Hastati, but then we have, what's this? Marian Volunteer Legionnaires. And I'm reading this over here on the right hand side, you can see. Uh, every time I move a unit, it has a Latin name and then it has the English variant underneath. Um, a Marian Volunteer Unit is only available after the Marian reforms have come in. Just the same, these Hastati units that I'm clicking on, they are the sword variant of the Hastati and they are only available after the Polybian reforms happen. When you first start your grand campaign as Rome, the only actual Hastati you'll be able to recruit is these ones down here. Uh, again, it's Samnite Hastati and regular Hastati, but they are spearmen. And so what reforms do is that they divide up all of the units in a roster based on historical events and the progression of a faction and civilization, civilization historically. So initially the Romans fought in a phalanx and they used spears very similar to Greeks. After fighting in the Semnite Wars and against Gauls and others in Italy, they eventually converted to the Polybian era of fighting which is with a sword, uh, a large shield, sorry, not sword, wow. A large shield and a sword. That's when they started fighting a little bit more use and that's where we start seeing uh, the Triple Achilles formation come out and whatnot. After that, we then have the Marian reforms, uh, named after Gaius Marius, who overhauled the Roman army, at least to some degree, it's debated on how much he actually did, to start having a more centralized system where you don't have Hastati of Principes and Triarii, now everyone is just a legionnaire. There are different types of legionnaires, for example there's a legionary right here, but then you also have a Marian first cohort, which is basically an eagle cohort. So it's a special kind of legionary, right? But very similar. Uh, after the Marian reforms, we then have the Imperial reforms, where Imperial legionnaires are recruitable. So the main thing you need to understand about reforms is that they are basically dividing your roster up into different time periods, as well as different 
progressions based on historical events. That's the bottom line. You don't need to know every single reform and when it happens or whatnot. And by the way, they are all turn-based and they are all based on the Imperium that your faction currently ho holds onto or has earned. And the larger your faction gets, the bigger your Imperium grows to. And then you just need to wait for the right turn time to come up. For example, some uh, reforms happen around like turn 90 and turn 60, some around 100, 120. Uh, it just depends on your cultural group, but you just wait for that and then you'll get a big event pop-up window that will say, hey, you just hit this reform. Now that we've talked about units and reforms and whatnot, let's go into the grand campaign very quickly for Rome and I just will show you a couple more systems and then we will call it there. Alright everybody, here we are checking out our final couple features that you need to know about Divided to Power before you jump into the game and get yourself started on a DEI in 2023. So first off, we are going to talk about the population. In my opinion, the biggest and the most fun but the most interesting mechanic in Divided to Para. Now you might have seen some population mechanics in other mods out there. DEI, I believe, was one of the first mods to have it. It's incredibly vital to DEI and how the entire mod operates. So what is your population? Well, obviously, it's basically what uh, amount of people works and lives in your cities. Um, for DEI specifically, it's going to be about the amount of men that you can recruit. So for example, if we go ahead and click on Roma, we're going to see our province panel pop up. We have the province of Latium, we have Rorum, we have uh, uh, Riminum, we have Asculum, and we have Aretium. All of these cities are inside of the province of uh, Latium, which basically they're all right here, right? You can see them all pretty easily, no problem. Now, in this province window, we're going to be able to control whatever buildings we want to recruit. We're going to be able to monitor things like sanitation, check out the garrisons in each city as well. But the big thing that we can do is look at the recruitable population of a city. So if we go to the top right hand corner right here around my mouse cursor, I'll zoom in for you guys to see. You'll see the number 53,189. Now this is not your population that you can have in your entire city, this is your recruitable population. So this is the amount of uh, men, or in some cases women, but primarily men that you can recruit into your armies that are of a fighting age and physicality, uh, capabilities and whatnot. You can recruit 53,000 men into your armies. Uh, if we look over here on the right hand side, you'll see it says population when you hover over it. Each region, that is each city, each city is called a region, has a population from which you can recruit forces to fight in your armies. If you hover right here over the um, mouse, I mean not the mouse, sorry, if you hover over this character right here, it will actually break your population down. Um, it's going to break it down into four different social classes basically. You have your patriciae, the elites at the top, and then it goes down from there. Then you have your plebeians, you have your proletari, and then your peregrini. Your peregrini are basically your fourth tier or your foreign population. Your proletari are your um, low tier citizens, but they are basically peasants. So they're the majority of your uh, culture, not really elite, very, very poor, pretty badly off, um, but they are recruitable. And then your plebs, these are typically your warrior class, these guys are a step above everybody else except the Patricia, and the Patricia are usually your elite people or the people who control your culture and your areas. Um, the number next to them, uh, right now it's all currently red and says minus uh, each number, for example the Patricia are minus uh, 15. That number is telling you how many people you actually have coming in or being taken out of your population for various region reasons. Now don't get too uh, scared that this is in the negative right now. We are in the middle of winter and there's a whole host of different reasons on which your population might be going up or down. Uh, another thing to consider as well is that your population strongly affects your economics. So if you look below the population number, you will see it says economics, and then it lists your agricultural income, industrial income, subsistence income, all income. Uh, these are basically different features or different aspects uh, of your population 
that will change based on the amount of population that you have. So right now we have a very strong population in Rome. 53,000 recruitable men is a lot of people to choose from. Um, and because we have a nice healthy population, we have benefits going all the way across the board in terms of our economics. However, if the city of Rome was raised to the ground and we were down to literally zero people, then the city isn't going to produce any money for you, right? It makes sense. So it's very important to understand the amount of people that live in your cities um, and especially the different social classes. For example, if you have a bunch of patricii or elites living in Rome, but you have no peregrini or proletarii, uh, you're not going to be doing very well in terms of things like your uh, subsistence income doing well, which is basically farming and agriculture. Um, you're not going to be doing very well on trade without uh, foreigners and whatnot as well. So there's a lot of things that can come into uh, play. Um, another big thing that population does is it allows you to recruit certain amounts of people. So if we come over here to Ligio to Equestris, we take them out of the city of Beneventum just because it bothers me that they're in there. Um, we go to our recruit units tab down here and we have a whole host of units we can recruit from. However, uh oh, when we hover over each unit, we have a little window open up. For example, over the cavalry here, I've always known as Equites, it says region Beneventum, manpower cost 100 patricii. And then underneath that, it says patricii available 1,426 men. These are recruitable people that you can choose from to join your army and fulfill the role of a certain unit. So for example, the Equites are from the Patricii social class, which is the elites, uh, which makes sense because they have to have a lot of money to be able to afford a horse, afford armor, and afford the honor and opportunity to ride as an Equite. So you're going to have only the elites available for this particular unit. Same thing for Terrarii. These are your relatively wealthy men, but they're also very experienced. They're older. Going to be a lot less of them, right? Uh, it also says the number and it changes based on each unit. For example, if I recruit an Equites unit, there's only going to be 100 horsemen in that unit. If I get a Terrarii unit, though, it's going to be 200 men in it. So I'm going to uh, have to have a manpower cost of 200 Patricii. And then it goes on from there. Uh, principes come from your plebs class or your plebeian class. 4,337 to choose from in the city and in the region of Beneventum. That's something else that you need to be aware of. Every different region, which is a city and the area around it, is different in population. So Beneventum has 33,800 men, uh, recruitable men to recruit from. Cosentia has 33,798. So it uh, is basically up to uh, your city and then the rough region around it. So the region for Cosentia would probably extend to like about there and then you'd be in Beneventum territory, roughly, approximately. But anyway, that's population. The next thing which I won't talk about for nearly as long is your supply system. Every region uh, has a supply system in it and we can see that by going over to this little bread and the road symbol next to your population a whole host of things are listed here um, it changes based on whatever area you're looking at for example Roma itself has high fertility that's why it says it in green the season is in winter obviously um, but the main thing you want to know is your current total supplies so you look at the top of that and you'll see it says total supplies 200 out of 420 uh, you can get 420 units of supply in the region of Roma just again just in the area of Roma not in your entire province but just in the area of Roma um, that's quite a lot that you can get up to 420 um, <laughs> I know funny uh, what do you call it set to have but anyway that's quite a lot and we can see towards the bottom that it comes from regional supplies which is at 80 out of 220 so the city of Rome itself provides 220 total but then your faction storage or supplies that you can shift around your faction are 200 as a maximum although currently it's at 120 out of 200 um, so as your supplies dwindle 
due to various things such as a harsh winter, or multiple armies marching through a region, or perhaps uh, your city gets destroyed, raised to the ground. In addition to all of these factors, there's a whole host of things that can happen. Even uh, random events can reduce supply. But basically, once supplies hit zero, uh, and it says zero out of 420 in Roma, that's where you're going to start seeing some massive negative effects. Uh, one of the biggest being if I had the, uh, the second legion over here go into Roma and the area of Roma had no supply, I would start losing um, men almost instantly and they would happen every single turn. We would start suffering attrition because if I click on an army and I go down here to the bottom left corner, it will talk about our supply situation. Right now I only have a very small army so it's in a low supply consumption set. And it, this army is basically set to local requisitions or where it's going to just buy its supplies from the local population. There's plenty of people here, there's plenty of supply available, my army is going to buy what it needs as it marches through the area. However, if there is no supplies to choose from and we don't have our own supplies, we are going to start losing men very, very quickly. Uh, and so the longer you stay in a region without supply, then the faster your men will start to die. You can lose an entire army to it. It takes a while, so pretty quickly you'll notice why all of your army has just suffered massive attrition. Um, and it's happening every turn. Pull your army out of that region. We go back to Beneventum and we start to get supplies from Beneventum. We go here, we see that Beneventum has 194 out of 420 supplies. That's quite good. Our army can gather supplies and rest up here. Um, it's going to be very crucial when you're using sub mods like 12 turns per year and whatnot as well. But um, that's just something that you need to understand. The best way to deal with your supply is by building agricultural buildings, for example, grain pits. Um, expand your supply storage. You see in the bottom left hand corner it says plus 200 overall. It also increases your supply lines plus one region. Uh, so your supplies will extend a little bit further outside of um, your territory or even within it but it'll just take it up to another city uh, and make it possible. It's not something that you can see besides clicking on your city though and looking at that supply tab. It's not as if you're going to start seeing uh, little carts go from Roma to Beneventum. It's not how it works unfortunately. Um, although we do see trade happening with some little ships going along there but anyway completely irrelevant um that's that uh and so that's the main two things i wanted to talk to you about here population and supply they are big you need to know about them they will affect your campaign relatively largely however they are also very common sense and it's not hard to wrap your head around these two features and as long as you keep these features in mind you should still be able to have a pretty solid campaign Especially if you go with the advice that I mentioned to you earlier, I highly recommend you check out those factions. If you yourself are a regular DI player, or you're a veteran and have a lot of hours behind you, feel free to comment down below and let any other new DI uh, people, any tips and tricks that you have. And please feel free to share this video with your friends who are new to DEI, or just anyone in particular you know that is new to DEI. I really hope that it helps them out. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I shall see you in the next one.